Okay, I guess it's been about five minutes. Okay, so let's um let's prove that our subgroup H is like the set of multiples of some integer. Okay. So let's do that. Um, we were able to show that if H has no positive elements, then it's just the only thing in it is zero. Okay. Now we're supposed to have some positive elements. And we want to show we want to find the least one, so we use a well-ordering principle. So let n be an s and greater than zero be the least element of s because the well-ordering principle says that a non-empty subset of say positive integers has a least element so we're like taking n to be the least element okay we claim that H is just all the multiples of N. Okay. Okay, so we want um, we want this to be true. We have an equality of sets. So we need to show that one thing is contained in the first, the second thing is contained in the first thing. We need to show that the first thing is contained in the second thing. Okay. Since N is in H, we can see that NZ is a subset of H. Okay. First, notice that N is in H since S is a subset of H and S, N is in S. Um, so that tells us that 2N is in H. Well, 2N is just N plus N. Right. Kn is in H for all k bigger than zero. But also, um, zero is in H since H is a subgroup. And since H is a subgroup and n is in H, also negative n is in H. Minus 2n is in H, and so on. So all the multiples of n are in H. And that is just because n is in H and H is a subgroup. Okay. Multiple of n. So let's take uh, some element of H. Let's suppose that A is in H. Okay. The division algorithm says that we can divide A by n. We write it as QN plus R, where zero is less than or equal to R is less than N. This is by the division algorithm. Okay. And wouldn't it be nice if R was zero, then our element, our element A would be a multiple of N. Okay. If R is greater than zero, 
then what happens? Well, first of all, R is A plus negative Q times N. Now we already see that negative Q times N, that's in H and A is in H. So H is a subgroup. So some of the things in H is also in H. So R is in H. And R is also positive. So R is in S because S is the positive things that are also in H. Okay. But R is in S. R is less than N, and N is supposed to be the least element of S. So the least element. But there's something smaller, that's bad. This is impossible. Well, this only happens if R is positive, okay? So if R is positive, then we get some impossible thing happening. So R must be not positive, R has to be zero. Okay. Well, if R is zero, then A is a multiple of N. That's what we wanted anyways. Okay. So A equals QN, which is in NZ. This proves that H is a subset of NZ. Okay, and that means that H is equal to NZ for some N, that's the end. Okay. Um, and because we're already talking about these subgroups, Well, no, this is fine. All right, so we have all these sub, um, we can kind of subgroup Z. So Z is a subgroup of it. And here we have the smallest one, which we'll call zero. Oops. Okay, and in between the trivial subgroup and the entire group, we have a bunch of things, right? Like um, we also have the multiples of B. Um, Kind of smaller than the multiples of two is the multiples of four. So we can kind of order them by how are they contained in each other. Okay. Then we also have the multiples of six. Notice the multiples, all the multiples of six are also multiples of three and two. So we have um, kind of subsets. So the, the lines are going from like a same. We have this nice picture, I think. Um, and you know, if you keep on going, you know, down here you have what I guess like the multiples of 48. Then down here you have the multiples of like 1728 or. Right? And it's a big, huge, like, web, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um... Okay, so this notation kind of gives us uh, a few things we need to talk about. Um, if we have a group and we take an element of the group, we can look at um, the group generated by the element or the subgroup generated by an element. Okay, so let's look at that now. Okay. 
All right, like for example, um, you know, the elements of 2z are just all the things you get starting with two and either like subtracting or adding it. Subtracting or adding only twos. Okay, so what if we just have a group and we take an element of the group and we either do like, so our element is maybe G and we either do like G, G times G, G times G times G, or we do it the other way, like G inverse, G to the minus two and, and all like that. Okay, so we have a definition. Okay, let G be a group. The G, B, and G, the subgroup. Generated by G is denoted G with these like angled brackets. Is defined to be um, just the things that you get like uh, G to the N or N is any integer. Okay. So, okay. So as an example, the multiples of two, well, that's just a subgroup of Z generated by two. And actually, if you just start with one, the subgroup generated by one is all of the integers. Well, any integer is just a multiple of one, right? The zero, kind of the zero subgroup of the integers that's generated by zero as an example. Okay. Um, we don't have to start with only one element, we can start with a bunch of them. Okay. So let me tell you about that. Then we define the subgroup generated by A This, we can define it in several different ways. Well, we can define it as like the set of all products of the form A1 to the E1, A2 to the E2, all the way up to AK to the EK, such that K is greater than or equal to zero, A1 up to AK are in A, and E1, up to ek are equal to either plus or minus one. Okay. So basically, take your subset A um, and multiply them all together, like taking inverses for some of them, and multiply them all together in all the different ways you can. And then that gives you a subgroup. Okay, this is called, A is a subgroup of G. Called the subgroup generated by A. Okay, 
Now, if A has only one element, then all you can do is just take that element and multiply it to itself or take its inverse. Okay. But if A has more than one element, what you get is more complicated. Okay. Um, so, so far, I hope you're either remembering or it's making sense. Um, so, Let me, before, so I think we're gonna have to take another break soon, but before we do that, um, let's see like, so we have this a uh, bunch of examples like given by the integers of grammar. Um, let me at least remind you okay, of a group. We have, let n be positive, be a positive integer. Let the set Sn be the set of all permutations sigma, the permutations from one up to n to one up to n. Okay, so that's, I've told you a set. What is a permutation? It is a function that's one to one and on to from one up to n to one up to n, okay. Here, permutation is another word for bijection. Okay. And I also have to tell you how to multiply two permutations. Okay. If sigma and tau are both functions, permutations, and we can compose them. Sigma of tau So what is the rule? Well, sigma tau of i, that's just sigma of tau of i. Okay, for all i and one up to n. Okay. Okay, then you can prove all the group laws from this group operation. So then Sn is a group. Okay. To prove this, you have to check a lot of things. Like you have to check that if sigma and tau are both bijection. Okay, so that the group law is well defined. And then you also have to check that if um, sigma is a permutation, then like there's a permutation sigma inverse. You also have to show that like sigma tau times omega is like you have to show the associativity law. You have to find the identity. Well, luckily, all that is not too bad. Okay. We'll just say we won't check this here. Okay. 
Well, we can do a little example. You can take n equals four. Okay, elements of S4. We'll represent them Okay, say like sigma, we could represent it by writing two rows of numbers. And on the top row, that'll be the domain, and then the bottom row will be like what each thing is mapped to. Okay, and I just write the same numbers, but in a some weird order. So maybe I'll write it like um, four, three, two, one. Okay. And maybe I'll have a tau. Maybe that'll be like one, two. Oops. Like that. Okay. Okay, so now we can like find, um, you can find tau inverse and we can find tau sigma and stuff like that, right? So, um, oh, let me, sorry. Let, let's write out what is tau inverse. Well, tau inverse is just a function where, um, you know, tau of one equals two, that means tau inverse of two has to be one. So tau inverse s is n two to one. Um, since tau of two equals three, tau inverse of three has to be two. Okay. Since tau of three equals four, since tau of four equals one, tau inverse of one has to be four. So this is the permutation tau inverse. Okay, and we can also compute like sigma tau, Okay, and what we do is we follow, we start at the top. And first we um, go, we go through tau and then we take that and, and plug it into sigma. Okay, so like starting from one, tau of one is two, and then sigma of two is three. So sigma tau of one is three. And if we start from two, we go from two to three and three back to two. And then going, starting from tau of three gets four and four goes to one. And let's see, tau of four goes to one and one goes back to four. Good. Okay, so we can find inverses, um, multiply things, and we have the identity. Well, the identity of the permutations is just the identity function. Okay. Um, right, so we can do all kinds of things with permutations. Um, it's almost time for us to take another break, but before we do, um, I want to tell you about, or at least I want to tell you the next thing we'll talk about, which would be quotient, the quotient group. Okay. So let me just remind you. Definition. 
let H be a subgroup G, okay. Whenever I write less than or equal to, this means H is a subgroup of G. Okay. Okay, so then we can define, can define the left cosets. So a left coset, this is take everything in H and multiply on the left by some X. Um, this is a subset of G. Okay. And in fact, um, G is partitioned into left cosets. Um, so this is XH is called a left coset. Of G. HX, which is defined similarly, is a right coset. Of G. Okay, and now we have um, a proposition, you know, that let's say that G is an element of XH, right? Yeah, if and only if um, G equals X H for some H. Maybe it's better if I don't have X's and G's. Maybe it's better if I replace this X with a G prime. So if I have the left coset G prime H, some other element G is in that coset little H. Okay. okay, and in fact, we can show that this condition gives us an equivalence relation. Oh yeah, and the proof of this proposition is just like, um, one line, so I guess it doesn't hurt to write it. G is in G prime H, if and only if G equals G prime H for some H, because G prime H is all the things like first G prime, then some element of H. Okay. So essentially this proposition is comes right from the the definition of left coset. Okay. So now let's see that. Uh, so define equivalence or congruence mod H by G 
G congruent to G prime mod H, if and only if G is equal to G prime, or sorry, G is equal to G prime H for some H. Okay. And then we have a nice theorem which tells us that congruence mod H is an equivalence relation um, the coset GH is the equivalence class of G and um, well, since we have an equivalence relation, the left cosets are the equivalence classes. That means that the equivalence, the left cosets are a partition of G. Okay, so um, G can be written as the disjoint union of the GHs and Dis distinct left cosets are em uh, are empty. Okay. Okay, so let's take another five minute break. And then we'll come back and we'll have the last part. Okay. Uh, yes, I can. But actually I'm about to turn off this. Oh, that was probably too far. I will try to keep it more sent. I'm about to leave, but I'll just leave it where it is.